What's up, y'all? I hope you're doing really well today. I am so excited for today's video because pruning cherry tomatoes happens to be very top of mind for me, and cherry tomatoes are by far my favorite type of tomato to grow. Now, my goal with today's video is to arm you with an evidence-backed strategy for pruning your tomato plants at home that is easy to apply to a home garden. Rather than cover every potential garden scenario and every potential pruning method out there, I'm going to skip straight to my recommendations and show you how I actually prune my tomatoes here at home. For the advice in this video to really apply, I'm going to make a few assumptions about you as a tomato gardener. The first is that you are planning to trellis or support your cherry tomatoes in some manner. The second is that you are growing indeterminate tomatoes rather than determinate tomatoes, which should be fine because the vast majority of cherry tomatoes are indeterminate. And the third is that you're willing to put in just a little bit of extra effort within reason to maximize the harvest that you get out of your tomato plants versus someone who perhaps takes a more relaxed philosophy towards pruning their plants. Now, if that sounds like you, great. I hope you'll stick around. I am way behind on my pruning chores, so let's go ahead and get into it. Unfortunately, our first pruning task here is kind of a melancholy one. We need to go ahead and remove all of the early flowering clusters, sometimes referred to as tomato trusses, until the plant is about 18 inches high and about a month after transplant. Doing so will allow the plant to direct those nutrients and sugars into root growth and vegetation growth, and counterintuitively, that in turn is going to actually produce a larger harvest overall compared to if we allowed the plant to fruit early on. You probably don't carry around a measuring tape, so just get an idea of where 18 inches is on your leg. I know that 18 inches is about the bottom of my kneecap, so I just use that for a practical reference. Now the flowering truss on this plant is still teeny teeny tiny, and I don't want to try and remove it yet because I might accidentally damage the plant. So let's go into the front yard garden and take a look at a larger version so you can see what size I like to actually remove them. This right here is a good size for pruning off a flowering cluster. There's little danger that I'm gonna make a mistake and hit the plant. Understandably, many gardeners are gonna skip this particular pruning step, particularly if they have a short growing season or if their plants are still small, like this poor straggler here that we planted out kind of late. But it is a good recommendation overall because early fruit setting is very energy intensive and can really stunt the plant. An early stunting of a plant can really be a lot of wasted potential for cherry indeterminate with all of their potential for a huge harvest over a very long growing season. In fact, even if you let a plant really grow much larger than this one and establish itself before flowering and fruiting, it can still set more fruit than is actually optimal and that amount of fruit to vegetation ratio can get a little bit out of whack. Honestly, I am very rarely going to intentionally thin out the amount of fruit on any given plant unless it's a really obvious situation where there's a ton of fruit on the plant, not that much vegetation, and I can notice that it's growing significantly slower than the other plants around it. Okay, let's swap plants here. And hey, look, if you are not thrilled about waiting so long to let your first tomato plant fruit, go ahead, let a couple just do their thing, go wild, fruit early. That's exactly what we're doing back here in what we call the toddler garden, where we kind of let our plants grow a little bit wild and just do their thing. We just do it in the understanding that this Super Sweet 100 cherry tomato and a few others like it back here are probably not going to reach their full potential. They'll be at least moderately stunted. Sometimes a tomato early in the season is worth two or three late in the season. On the bright side, it also makes for a great pruning demo plant, which brings us to... So you've probably heard that it is important to prune off the lower leaves of a tomato plant in order to create an air gap between the soil where tomato diseases can potentially live and the first set of leaves on the plant. And that is 100% true. But before you whip out the pruners and start going to town, let's talk a little bit about when and why we want to do it. First off, you may notice that I have left some of these lower leaves on the plant a little bit longer than maybe most gardeners would, and that is intentional. I live in a very dry climate, and at this point in our season, very early in our season, disease simply isn't rampant. 
Also, all of this mulch that I put down really creates a very effective splash guard between the soil and the plant anyways. More importantly, these lower leaves are necessary and important for the plant to produce enough energy to continue its growth and set that initial group of fruit, which is energy intensive. These taller leaves up here really haven't begun to shade out the lower leaves all that much, which means they are still receiving sunlight and are still productive. At this point in our season and where I have most of my tomatoes planted, I'm not overly worried about sun scald. That said, if your plants are at the point where they're receiving intense sunlight over long days, all of these leaves, including the lower leaves, really help protect the plant from sunburn. That said, I do find there's a lot of variance on that front depending on the variety of tomato plant you're growing. Let's take a closer look. Just compare this black cherry tomato, which is actually quite full relative to its height, to this yellow pear tomato, which is noticeably sparser and taller. Both plants are growing very well and appear to be healthy and thriving, but their different growth habits and vegetation mean I have to be a little more careful to create airflow on the black cherry and a little more careful not to let the yellow pear burn. All that said, soon enough, these lower leaves will actually be a net negative on the plant's productivity as they begin to age and as they begin to receive really not enough sunlight to productively contribute to the plant's overall production of sugars. And also, while it doesn't mean much in this uh, container that this plant is in, most of our tomatoes are out in the garden where I like to companion plant things like this tatsoi and this chamomile. If we have too many lower leaves, all of the ground will be shaded out and we won't be able to do that. The tomatoes are definitely my priority in their area of the garden, but it's nice to get a little bit more production out of the space when I can. Keep in mind that some professional commercial tomato growers may actually try to maintain a specific ratio between the number of leaves on the plant and the number of fruit on the plant, and sometimes between one to one or three to one. Realistically, I certainly don't have time to try and be that meticulous about my pruning, but I find that it's a helpful framework to keep in mind as I'm thinking about how do I maintain these plants throughout the entire growing season to stay stay healthy and not just at a specific point in time. So in conclusion, I definitely do recommend pruning off lower leaves, but not right at the beginning of the season, not right after transplant when they're most needed to help that plant establish itself. This is still a very healthy leaf that is producing for this plant, even though it's only four inches off the ground. Okay, let's take a closer look here at actually removing some lower leaves from our main garden tomatoes. As you can see, these have started to really drop and touch the ground and are starting to age out, so they're a good candidate for pruning. We're also getting very close to letting these plants flower and set fruit, so I'm not as concerned with letting it build up energy stores. Unfortunately, it is really, really easy to leave just a tiny bit of tissue intact when you're pruning a tomato, which often results in a rip or a tear on the stem. Here's a mostly healed scar on one of mine where I screwed up when transplanting. These tears hurt the plant and can lead to infections too. That's why I use a sharp knife or a pair of gardening scissors. Even with a good tool though, it's easy to mess up like I did here. Don't be like me. Finally, here's an example of a few lower leaves on plants that I'm gonna leave on for now as they aren't touching the ground. They're a little less than a foot off the ground actually, but I wanna keep them until the first cluster of fruit successfully sets. Hey, if this type of content is interesting and helpful to you, please consider liking the video or even subscribing to the channel. It really helps me out and I definitely appreciate it. All right, let's get back into it. Here is where things get interesting. There are dozens of ways to train indeterminate cherry tomatoes for big harvest and for easy maintenance. That said, this video is not about all of those other ways. How I recommend you train your indeterminate cherry tomatoes at home is to the double leader system, also known as twinning or pruning for a strong Y. Pruning for a double leader means that each of your cherry tomato plants will have the original primary stem and one sucker, which are both allowed to grow and produce fruit. That's opposed to the one main leader like I would recommend for an indeterminate slicer tomato or the unchecked number of suckers like we might recommend for a determinate tomato plant. I recommend the double leader system based on research from the Cornell University Extension Office as well as my own experience which found that it strikes a really nice balance. But before we get into the mechanics of exactly how to prune for a double leader, let's take a quick look at what that research found. There's a ton of great info in this paper so I will definitely link it in the description but for now now check out this bar graph right here. The main takeaway is that when researchers evaluated both yield, so how much harvest uh, the tomato growers were receiving in conjunction with how much labor was required for three different types of cherry tomato pruning styles, the, uh, the double leader system came out 
ahead uh, in our little garden and this is probably true for you as well i would imagine uh, we're not paying ourselves for labor or, or selling our fruit we're eating it we're also not growing in a hoop house like the conditions in this research but there is still an opportunity cost to our time spent maintaining our tomatoes just like the growers in this paper and we still do want the biggest harvest possible right so i really think the conclusions hold up. So the other benefit of having two liters is that it gives you the flexibility to prune for a denser foliage during the height of summer, especially if you're someone who's growing in a climate with really hot scorching summers, that can give you a little bit of extra protection on the stem. Too much heat and sunlight, even on a warm weather plant like a tomato, can actually hurt the plant and negatively impact fruit setting and pollination. You'll just want to be careful that it's not getting too dense and too gnarly later in the season, which can restrict airflow and potentially lead to disease. Okay, let's take a quick look at how I pruned this cherry tomato plant for a double liter and how you can do the same at home. It is super easy, I promise. Step one in the process is knowing how to identify the suckers on your plant. Suckers are these lateral shoots on your tomato plant that if left unchecked will eventually produce their own sun leaves and actually set fruit. In fact, suckers will produce their own suckers. Suckers are generally found in the elbows of the plant. What I mean by that is between a main stem and a group of sun leaves. So like this big one, one right here. Now, when suckers are small and they first pop out, they're going to have sort of these smaller, curlier leaves, and they're generally pretty easy to identify. Okay, now to achieve the desired double liter effect, the first thing that you're going to want to do is find the first flowering cluster on the plant. Obviously, this one's pretty developed, so it's easy to find. After that, we're going to look for the first sucker directly beneath it. This sucker directly beneath that first flowering cluster is the one that we are going to allow to grow out and become the double leader or the Y branch in our plant. And now that we have identified the sucker that we are going to allow to grow out, all of the other suckers should be pruned off. And generally speaking, it's a lot easier to prune a sucker off when they're still small, like this teeny tiny one, because they're gonna come off real easy right in your finger. And just be sure that what you're pruning is actually a sucker. Most of the time, they're really easy to identify, but sometimes as the plant gets older and matures, it can grow in a little bit wonky, and it's not impossible to accidentally actually prune off the growing tip of one of those main axes rather than a sucker. And if you do that, unfortunately, it's kind of game over. At that point, you have to either let a, a remaining sucker grow in as the main stem at that point, if you have a remaining sucker, or you just have to replace the plant, unfortunately. It's never going to grow back correctly. So the easiest way to be sure that what you're looking at is actually the sucker is just to kind of give it a minute and let it grow in a bit. And then you can trace in the main stem at that point and make sure that that main stem is putting off a flowering cluster like this one right here, which is pretty well developed well before that sucker ever does. The sucker will take much longer to produce its first flowering cluster versus the next flowering cluster up on that main stem. If you've let a sucker grow for a little bit too long, but you've identified one that you do want to remove and it's just a little bit thick rather than pinching it off i do recommend that you go ahead and get a sharp tool to cleanly remove it again i just like to use a sharp knife because that's what i typically have on my person in the garden now this plant looks nice and clean because i already removed all of the excess suckers let me show you what that looked like Now that it's all cleaned up, you can really see that clear Y pattern. Here's the original stem, which will be leader one, and here's our second leader, the sucker that we left on, a very clean Y. 
Now as your plant matures and continues to set fruit, you're gonna wanna go ahead and continue removing all of these suckers on both leaders. As I mentioned, this sucker that we're allowing to grow in will actually produce suckers of its own, suckers on suckers. We'll also wanna go ahead and prune off these lower leaves as the plant grows taller and as it sets its lower fruit. You can kind of imagine this massive leaves and fruits gradually growing up, both leaders up higher and higher and higher as the plant matures. Otherwise, final note here, you are going to want to trellis or support both leaders not just this primary original stem. The second leader is going to put on quite a bit of fruit and it's going to need some support. That's it. I really hope you found this interesting and I'll see you next time.